Okay, great. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Peterson. Uh, I work in the office of the CTO at Cumulus Networks, and I'm filling in uh, for, for Nolan Leak, my boss, the CTO, who's right in the front here with the uh, long hair, so they keep me in check. We're going to talk about deploying OpenStack uh, fairly quickly, driven kind of from the network perspective. Now, a lot of folks don't necessarily realize what Cumulus Networks does. So we provide a operating system for bare metal switches. So the operating system is a fork of Debian. And what's neat about Cumulus Linux is that it's hardware accelerated. So you get the same performance of a traditional switching platform, uh, but the flexibility of Linux as the management or the control plane. And so we're going to kind of break down, essentially going from the loading dock into production. Uh, I'll, I'll show both a video and some slides that kind of give you some background of how that's accomplished. Uh, the first thing to start off with is getting an operating system installed on these bare metal switches. So you might have heard of bare metal switches or white label switches. The analogy here is the same as compute. So when you're buying a compute platform, say a Supermicro or a Dell or an HP, typically you're not getting the operating system bundled at the same time. So you'll use a USB stick or you use Pixie to install that operating system on that compute device. We follow that same model in the networking space. So we use an open source bootloader called Oni. This is something that Cumulus Networks contributed to the Open Compute Foundation. And it's effectively a method of installing an operating system completely unattended. Uh, we like to call it Pixie on steroids, if you will. And so what's great about Oni is that it supports a lot of moder modern protocols like DHCP v6. Um, you can download images via HTTP. It includes request headers like the serial number of the switch and the manufacturer. So it's a real nice way to get the operating system installed on the bare metal switch uh, completely unattended. When we look at Cumulus Linux, the product itself, as I mentioned, it's uh, based, the current product is based off of the Debian Wheezy distribution. Uh, and there's a lot of value add in not creating a, a brand new distribution that doesn't include some heritage. And for us, one of the great things about that is that you can take advantage of the robust packages that are available for Debian. So Debian has a little over 40,000 packages available in their app Git repository. Those are available to be installed on the Cumulus platform. So if you have a particular library or scripting language or maybe even a text editor that you want to be able to use on your network device that's completely possible within Cumulus Linux. Our model is that the switch should look and feel like a server. So when you run ifconfig, you see all 48 ports. Same way you would manage a server in terms of using configuration management or uh, monitoring or even AAA, say LDAP, for example. Again, that would be applied the same way on, on the networking side. All the tools run natively, so ifconfig, iproute2, quagga, LLDP, all these standard network tools that you would use on a server that has a couple NICs, those all run natively under Cumulus Linux. So it's obviously required at OpenStack, uh, an OpenStack event that we have an OpenStack diagram. And so where do we fit into the picture? So Cumulus Linux, again, is an operating system for bare metal switches, and it provides hardware acceleration. So that means that we're getting the same performance as traditional switches, but again, that flexibility of the management of the control plane. Within the OpenStack world, what that allows you to do is pick and choose different architectures. So you may choose to use an overlay technology like Aconda or MetoNet. You may want to do a more traditional layer two uh, deployment, so you only, ha only have one or two racks. Uh, you don't need a large overlay technology maybe in that case. So there's a lot of flexibility in the architecture that you can deploy. And again, this is radically different than a lot of the other traditional network vendors which have a very prescriptive approach of this is the only way we support open stack. Um, we're very flexible on different deployment models there. So I want to walk through uh, our example here. We have what's called a solution guide available on our website. And a solution guide is essentially a, a PDF document that includes all the steps to accomplish this end result, uh, both do, using automation, which we'll walk through, and all the manual steps. That includes all the prerequisite documentation too, like diagrams, uh, a, a bomb list of items uh, to cable up or buy. Um, so it's very prescriptive on how to do this deployment. So if I'm going kind of fast, just realize that you can download the documentation uh, for what we're talking about uh, this afternoon. So 
we're going to start a, kind of a very basic architecture uh, using MLAG. Uh, that's a, a multi-link aggregation. Pretty much every switching vendor, every NOS vendor has some sort of layer two uh, technology that can span multiple switches and have a common layer two, a broadcast domain. Uh, Cisco calls it VPC, uh, Juniper virtual chassis, Arista calls it MLAG. Uh, everyone's got a slightly different name, but essentially it's the, the same goal of expanding a, a layer two domain between multiple switches uh, and still having some high ability or redundancy uh, with spanning tree. So what does that look like starting from kind of the basic building block uh, of a single hypervisor? So in our example, we're connecting the, a physical compute device to two different switches in an active configuration. So from the hypervisor's perspective, it looks like a standard LACP link or a link aggregation link. Uh, there's no hacking or any changes required on the hypervisor. It just looks like a normal link ag. Now obviously in that hypervisor, we're going to have multiple tenant networks that are present there. There's a link between the, the switches as a communication or a signaling link, uh, essentially to do heartbeat uh, and other health check statuses between the, the MLAG or the CLAG environment. Uh, these deployments can be fairly small. Uh, typically, we see MLAG used for uh, two to four racks and very small deployments, uh, but you can continue to expand them out. Um, so that, that scales uh, pretty efficiently, uh, particularly for uh, smaller deployments to get started. Uh, a lot of folks, again, they like to start off with uh, MLAG because it's a, a kind of a known quantity uh, in terms of uh, debugability and it's fairly simple. Um, there's no uh, VLANs or overlays or tunnels or anything in between their traffic um, to get that architecture up and going. So it's a very simple uh, initial implementation, if you will. So part of our goal was to have some constraints here that represented exactly what a customer would experience. And so in our model here for this solution guide, we basically use a USB stick that provision not only the switches but also the compute devices. And so because of that, we have some basic constraints. We need to know how the cabling is configured. We attempt to auto-detect that as best as we can, but we do have some requirements that there's a minimum amount of cabling uh, between switches that are running the, the MLAG uh, signaling protocol and that there's a minimum amount of bandwidth available as you build this architecture. And again, that's all spelled out uh, in the solution guide. It's not strict on, on the speed, but again, it's a best practices for uh, deploying this architecture. So I'm going to roll through a video that kind of walks through the steps. The video is about three minutes, and I'm going to annotate it uh, along the way um, so that we can get a little bit uh, of a look and feel of, of how that, would, um, that deployment would occur. So let's get this up here. So we made this video in collaboration uh, with Dell, who's one of our hardware partners, and you can go to their booth out on the floor. And again, the idea here is that we're modeling from going from the loading dock into production, all the steps that would be required there. Now, obviously, we advertise this as a, a 20 minutes or less. If it takes your facilities team you know, three weeks to open up a box, obviously, that's not going to be 20 minutes or less. But the time is basically when you stick the USB stick and engage the power. So as you notice here, there's a requirement of, of cabling that we show in the video. The intention here is that there's enough bandwidth going down uh, between the leaf and spine switches. We plug in the USB stick. Because the device doesn't have an operating system installed on it, the very first thing that occurs is the ONI mode gets initiated. And so ONI is, again, that open source bootloader, very similar to Pixie in functionality, uh, but very modern. So again, it has things like HTTP, SCP, FTP. It's not just uh, a single threaded TFTP uh, IPv4 only solution. Um, ONI can also source um, from a local USB device. So again, one of the constraints that we set up in this demonstration was the idea of setting a, a complete deployment without any internet access, and again, very prescriptive on the cabling that's done. So what will happen the very first time is that the ONI bootloader is run, and that installs the operating system completely unattended. So if we look at this screen here, we see the uh, bootloader uh, of uh, the switch that we're using. This is a, an S, uh, sorry, an uh, S6000, which is a, a 32 uh, by 40 gig switch from Dell, and so it will have its standard bootloader to get the system up and going. Uh, ONI will then initiate. 
ONI goes through various waterfalls, so it detects if there's an Ethernet plugged into the management port. If there is, it will bring link up. It will attempt uh, IPv6 neighbor discovery, uh, DHCPv6. Eventually, it's going to fall back to a known static IP address. It will continue that waterfall also for the discovery protocol. So, for example, it will attempt to look for a DHCP response that includes a URL uh, of the image that it needs to download. If it doesn't get that response, it will then assume that the DHCP server is also an HTTP or FTP server. So again, it goes through these waterfalls on getting onto the network, using a, a, a discovery protocol or a, a file transfer protocol, and then the file name. So the file name can be very particular of a certain platform and a manufacturer and an architecture, or it can be a very generic file name. And again, in this use case, what we're doing is installing uh, from the USB stick. So as you can see, it, it mounts uh, from the USB stick, uh, basically it extracts the image uh, and runs MakeFS, does all the various partitioning, and installs the operating system. And again, this is typically done uh, unattended and out of band. One of the great things about ONI is that it allows monitoring capabilities as this installation is occurring. So it does syslogging. If you send that DHCP response, you can SSH or Telnet into ONI. So again, our goal was to kind of free uh, the environment of using console cables, making it very modern to uh, approach provisioning. Now, the first time Cumulus Linux comes up, again, looks very similar to a, a traditional uh, Debian-based operating system. One of the things you'll note here is that because we've installed Cumulus Linux the first time, there's no license key to enable the platform uh, to actually load all the front panel ports. So the way that we do license enforcement on Cumulus Linux is that a license file must be present to start up a process which we call Switch D, which enables those front panel ports to be available. Without the license, only the EF0 or the management port is available. And so as you can imagine, we have a same, uh, very similar workflow for uh, Cumulus Linux in the sense of zero-touch provisioning. Pretty much every vendor has some methodology of zero-touch provisioning. Typically, that is, I'll fetch a configuration file uh, that happens to be the name of uh, my management uh, MAC address, for example. And the Cumulus world, we're very flexible on what you can use uh, for a zero-touch provisioning script. Essentially, what we do is a DHCP request on that management Ethernet zero port. We look for a URL response. We fetch that URL, and we go ahead and execute that as a shell script. Now, there's some uh, safety checks in there. We look for a regex that's uh, present in that shell script. And on the Cumulus Linux platform, uh, we ship with... Uh, Bash, Ruby, Python, and Perl pre-installed. So you can write your ZTP script in those four different languages, or you could in fact call an app git to install an additional language or library if you needed to. And so in this particular example, what we're doing is sourcing from that USB stick. Uh, again, the ZTP follows our ONI methodology where it will discover on the network first. If that's not present, it can also discover locally with a USB stick. Again, same sort of waterfall approach to what that file name is that it executes the ZTP script as. And so we're doing a number of steps here in terms of installing a license, uh, getting the platform up and going. And because this is the first switch, it's the genesis switch of this deployment, we're Go ahead and we're enabling a DHCP server, we're enabling an NTP server, DNS server, enough infrastructure so that all the other switches and compute devices can be booted off the network. So one of the things that we mentioned in the solution guide is that all of these switches and all of the servers are plugged into an out-of-band network. And on that network is where we're running this infrastructure that provisions the environment. So the very first thing that happens is this initial genesis switch gets enabled with various daemons and configurations. So you can see a little bit of that uh, coming out in the console. Again, this is intended to be uh, a complete unintended operation, so the, the output is, is, is not the prettiest because generally you're not plugged into the console cable for these uh, uh, various steps. So as you can see, um, the system has been configured with a host name. It also has a configuration file uh, that it's received uh, for its network. So we have those peer links. Those are the MLAG links between the, the paired switches. And then we have other various links, uh, as, as this is NovaNet, where we have a, a range of VLAN tags that we're supporting. So next, we're going to have um, uh, the next switch come up 
which is uh, mated with this. So we call uh, the first switch Spino 1, the second one is Spino 2. And again, it's going to source from the network a ZTP script. Uh, this one, the output's uh, a little bit more um, verbose, a little bit easier to see. One of the things that we're doing in this script is detecting the cabling. As I said earlier on, we're prescriptive in the amount of cabling, but not necessarily the speed or which ports it's plugged into. So we try to auto-detect that as best as we can. So this is the second switch that we're building. It will find its mated pair. We're discovering that based upon um, a LLDP chassis MAC address. So that's essentially a unique identifier between the platforms. Uh, it's detected that its peer is Spino1, uh, its IP address, and its MAC address of its peer. And then it will start configuring its local uh, interface um, that it's bringing up. So its local et cetera network interfaces file. It installs a license, all the other prerequisites to get the platform up and running. Obviously, restarts various daemons and any other dependencies. Now, on the server side, uh, we didn't actually capture a video that shows uh, traditional Pixie booting. I'm sure everyone's seen that and, and loves Pixie. It's, it's awesome. It's everyone's best friend. Uh, but essentially there, because on this network we've offered a DHCP server and a TFTP server, uh, we can install an operating system completely unattended. Uh, in our solution guide, we're actually using uh, Ubuntu's distribution for OpenStack, and we essentially offer a pre-seed file uh, that the servers will fetch down. And each time a server finishes completing its installation, uh, that's recorded on the, the Genesis switch, and so we can enumerate the host name for additional servers. So the first server will be called Controller01, the second server will be Compute01, followed by Compute02, and that will continue to enumerate. So obviously at the end of this, where all the switches and the compute environment has been provisioned, uh, then you go into your, your standard uh, you know, Horizon interface uh, to create a VM. So because the, the talk is limited to 20 minutes today, we didn't want to uh, do exactly everything that you could see. We want to refer you to our solution guide that's available and a, a demonstration that's available both in our, our booth and, and the Dell booth. We go back to the slides here to just highlight very quickly uh, some of the uh, approaches that were uh, shown in the video. Again, we use the USB stick on that first Genesis switch. That installs that switch environment, but it also makes a infrastructure available on the management network or the out-of-band network. So all the other switches and all the compute devices can install completely unattended. Uh, the shell script that runs on here is fairly simple. All these scripts are available as part of our solution guide. Uh, so we try to make these as, as simple and easy as possible. These are mostly bash scripts. Uh, there's a little bit of Python that does things like IP calculation, that sort of stuff. But it, it's fairly easy to read. The intention was that a lot of our customers are network engineers that may not have a lot of scripting or Linux knowledge. So we wanted to make it fairly easy to be able to uh, read these scripts and see all the various tasks that are occurring. Again, this initial Genesis environment is really setting up the infrastructure for all the other switches and compute to install. The additional switches are slightly different, right, because they're booted from the network and they receive, again, the license and their configuration over the network. We continue that for enumerating what their host name is and what their IP address is. On the server side, um, again, we, we serve a pre-seed file. We have a small little CGI that basically enumerates the host name, uh, some of the RAID settings, that sort of thing. It makes it very easy to just install all these compute devices, again, completely unattended. Our, our model here is that if you cable it correctly and you put all the devices in this kind of factory default state, you should be able to walk away and in 20 minutes all this infrastructure is built for you. Uh, after the pre-seed is done, we essentially do a phone home to say this device has completed being installed as compute device. The BIOS is still configured to boot from the network, so we actually write out a Pixie config that says next time that compute device boots, boot it from the local hard drive. This is a trick that a, a lot of infrastructure providers will do. 
Um, again, on the uh, OpenStack side, uh, we're using uh, Ubuntu's distribution, and we use a number of Puppet modules to get all the OpenStack infrastructure up and running. Uh, it's very simple. It's essentially a one-time script that runs a uh, Puppet agent to get all the dependency packages installed. So we have a, a link up at the top there, and again, we've got a, a tarball and a zip file that includes all the examples that we showed here today, both documentation and also uh, the scripts that are available. One thing I wanted to point it out was a lot of people came to our booth and wanted to get the, the Rocket Turtle. Uh, we have some Rocket Turtles down here. If you'd like to get one, we just have to scan your badge. And I have eight seconds for questions. So any questions in three seconds? Okay, thank you very much. We'll be back at the back here at the Cumulus booth. Cheers.